So here I am again with part five of my uh, series on how to create uh, some great sounding Helix patches. This time we're going to dive right in and get into a few of the parameters that I think a lot of people might be a little bit afraid of. Uh, the one sort of to the uh, bottom down here of the um, amp uh, controls. Um, Line 6 has done a really interesting thing here. Anybody, anybody who is used to using tube amps in uh, in the real world knows that they can be finicky creatures at uh, the best of times. Uh, there's so many variables to what are going to make them sound a certain way. Uh, everything from you know how old our tubes are, what tubes we're using, uh, the quality of the AC coming out of the wall and the venue or the studio we're at. Um, it just goes on and on and on. Um, as they get older, they just start acting different depending on what's going on with the components inside them. Line 6 has done a really neat thing here where they've tried to actually work in a certain amount of control over some of those factors, which we would never have in the real world. I mean, our tubes age as they age, depending on how much we use them or just depending on the quality of the tube, whether we got a good tube or a bad tube and so many other factors. So we don't have the ability to control those things in, in real life, but Line 6 has given us a lot of those abilities here. So we're going to look today at a couple, well, not a couple features, a bunch of features, SAG, HUM, Ripple, BIAS, and BIAS X. And I also want to just touch on early reflections too. Not that that's a power amp thing, but uh, I think it's still uh, something a lot of people have question about. But I'm just going to go through this in order. The way I did this um, is I created a bunch of patches with um, one for the SAG test. You can see over here, hum test, ripple test, bias test, bias X test, and then a parameter test where I just kind of mix and match some of the parameters as I saw. Uh, fit so that we could AB some things or even ABC some things to see how dramatic an effect that these uh, these settings can have. So in the SAG test, I set up snapshots. In all of the tests, for instance, I set up snapshots with extreme settings for all of these. And I find a lot of times when we don't know what something does, we tend to maybe just shy away from it and not even bother to try to look into what it does. I go the other way. I say, you know what, if I'm uncertain as to the effect some control is going to have, I crank it up, I turn it right off, and I just go between those two extremes. And I really play for a while with it and listen to the effect that each parameter has on the tone. And then, uh, you know, even if I don't fully understand why it's doing it, it doesn't really matter. I know what effect it has on the tone, and then I can just know how much of that or how little of that I want, if any, or, you know. Um, and I find that that's just a really good way to do it. But I'm going to do my best. I'm not a real technical guy as far as, um, you know, working on tube amps or anything like that. I'm more just a player and kind of and know how to dial in some sounds. But I'll try to explain as best as possible what I think is going on here, uh, what some of these terms stand for, and then uh, do some playing with them with some extreme settings and then some settings that might actually work for you. So without further ado, let's get into this. We're gonna start looking first at the SAG setting. So what I've done here is I've set up a patch with the Brit Trim Norm. Now, one thing that Line 6 does say in the manual is these are going to react much better. You're going to hear a, a much greater reaction with these if our master is on 10. And I think with even some of them, our drive on 10, just because what's happening is these are controls that are usually going to base, be based around the power section of the amp, which is controlled by the master. So by cranking that up, these are not settings I would normally use for this amp or for most amps, just cranking everything up to 10. But for this purpose, I'm going to do that simply because uh, we want to hear what's going on with these. You know, Once we understand that, then we can dial our settings and then play with those to just have, sort of instinctively maybe set them to something we know we would like without even hearing it. Um, what I've done too, I've turned the delay off. This is kind of my normal um, uh, template that I would use for most patches. So I've turned all the EQ and dynamics off at the end. I don't want any dynamics on this at all because a lot of these settings, SAG and, and BIAS, are going to affect the dynamic feel of the amp. So I don't want it to be confused with the dynamics that we have set at the end. We can always put that back in later if we so desire, right? So um, we'll talk about SAG first. I've left everything else kind of stocked to, to what it is, um, what it just comes up as default uh, with the Brit Trim Norm channel. So what I've done is I've set up three snapshots. I have one um, that has SAG set to zero. And if, if you notice right here, as I switch through my snapshots, I have one that SAG jumps to five, and I have one that SAG jumps to 10. So we can, 
I think the default setting pretty much is five. And I, I don't know if it's on all AMP models, but I find that most of the default settings are within that. If you notice here, the bias is at 5.5 on the uh, Brit trim. But, you know, I'm just kind of keeping everything in the middle right now. So the basic tone that we have here, I'll just play some basic riffs just so you can hear what the tone is set at default with the normal drive and the master at 10. So very crunchy, you know, probably, like I said, not something that I really would use. I find it's just a little too dimed, but so that we can hear what these uh, different effects do. So first of all, what is SAG, right? Um, you hear a lot of people talking about it. Um, SAG is basically how the uh, voltage in the amp is going to react to a transient peak or a transient spike. Now you might say, what's a transient spike? Well, a transient spike or peak is going to happen on the guitar when we hit the strings right that's going to be when we have an attack right so that that um that pick hitting the strings is going to be a sharp sound so what happens is there's a there's a voltage drop when that happens um and that's what the sag is so the voltage drops on that peak and then it recovers right so that's why they call it a sag so the depending on how much of that we get it's going to really affect the sound. It's going to act much in a way like a compressor. So it's going to kind of squash the sound. We get a squishy feel to it, which can be what we want, or maybe it's not what we want. You know, if we're playing uh, some modern metal stuff, gent type material, you don't want that sag. You just want that really crisp, um, you know, attack to the notes. You don't want that to sag down. Uh, when you you want that to cut through right much like setting a compressor with a really fast attack time where it's going to squash that transient at the beginning so we don't want that so that's what sag basically basically is do some examples um where we can just kind of uh jump in here and see what this is so this would be the default setting okay it's fine so, you know not, nothing we don't really have anything to to compare it to at this point so that that works right so if i jump all the way down to zero now on the sag there's really not a dynamic sound to it now it's very flat out now i'm going to go to 10 and see if you can hear the difference and i'll switch back and forth between those so this is a sag setting of 10. um whenever through the video you can see right up here watch up here i've named everything appropriately this is sag zero if i hit the next one it goes sag 10. you can also watch the sag control down here um and then you know sag 5 sag 10 sag 0. so if you look up here where the snapshot is they're appropriately named so here's sag 10 setting now you can really hear the attack on the on the um, front of the note just squash down one thing you'll notice too is i've i've adjusted the channel volume when it's seg five it's at five Sag zero, it's at five, but here I bumped it up on sag 10. The, the sag, uh, putting the sag that high actually squashes the volume down. I wanted to have the, this, the, the volume level match so we can hear what that effect is doing, not just hearing a volume jump up and down. So again, let me go between sag zero and sag 10 now. Here's zero. really hear a difference in the attack of the note if I just kind of like very different sound to it uh, play some familiar riffs now if I switch back to you know in the middle Five. Now this is the type of thing a lot of players say you can even maybe feel when you're playing more than you can hear it. Uh, and that is that is true. I'm probably noticing it more than even somebody listening. But I think with those dramatic settings, even somebody listening that isn't playing can tell the difference between what's going on there. So uh, that's SAG, basically. That's what it's going to do. So now that we've gone to those extremes, we have a good idea of what actually is happening. 
and maybe a better idea of how maybe we can dial it in. If we want a little bit more of that squishiness to the sound, maybe we're not going to go to 10. Maybe instead of five, we jump to eight, seven, whatever, you know, but it gives us another parameter that we don't have to dive into sort of the safe parameters that everybody likes to, you know, bass, middle, treble, presence to try to get that. And maybe even somebody who doesn't know how to use a compressor that well might be able to use SAG to kind of get that sound that they want, right? Okay, so let's jump over then to hum. So I created a whole other um, patch here for hum test. Um, same app, same settings, everything is exactly the same as before. But if you notice, I have three patches now, or three, sorry, snapshots. I have hum zero, hum five, and hum 10. Hum five again is going to be the default setting. So let's just listen to that same sound as we would have heard before. Okay, fine. Let's jump right up to hum 10 because this gets pretty extreme. I'm not even going to play. I just want you to listen to the sound of what's going on here. You hear that low level, almost like 60 cycle hum, right? That we would all tend to not want in our sound, right? But the fact is sometimes that is in there and that's the imperfection of a tube amp. So Line 6 has done a really neat thing here in that they've allowed us to be able to dial that in. Now, you might say without even hearing how it affects the tone, you could say, well, what, how could we use this? Well, maybe we're trying to replicate the sound of a very old vintage recording, right? That, that the amp did have some of that. What a great way we just dial that in a little bit. Yeah, there's that. It's gonna give it a more authentic sound. But besides that, it also affects the tone, okay? What you'll notice here, let me, let me play a little bit with this. I'm gonna play some single notes. I'm gonna kind of dig in a little heavy on these. And you'll notice that the, the notes just get a little bit nasty. If you heard that on the tail end, it really kind of is breaking up in a real, real rude way. And maybe not what we want, but maybe it is what we want for a special effect or just whatever. Maybe to mimic something, a sound we, we, we've heard that we're trying to copy, you know? So it gives us a very realistic way to do it. Now, let's go to hum zero. We notice that hum goes away. Now, if I do that same thing where I let the note tail, I don't get those really nasty, rude artifacts at the end. You'll hear, I'll go between the two. It's hum zero. You hear that warbly breakup at the end uh, when the hum is on 10, right? Back to hum zero. So it adds a, an interesting quality. And again, if we understand what it does, then we can we can know just be better informed on how to dial that in almost instinctively, right? So, um, okay, so let's move on to Ripple now. Ripple was the one that I was a little less certain about exactly what was going on with it. And one thing I noticed, and maybe maybe I'm wrong about this, but it was just an observation I had. Um, it seemed to have more of an effect when I had the hum on 10. I, I don't know. And even then, switching between them, what, what the ripple is, I believe, is when the rectifier uh, changes the AC current to DC, it can't do it to absolutely all of the current. So there is a little bit of remaining AC current, which is called ripple. Um, which ends up in the signal, which, which would obviously, like everything, has an effect on the signal. So that's what I think line six worked in here. And again, I think it just gives a slight little bit more of a rude nastiness to the sound, right? So let's start off with the ripple test just set to its kind of default again, but I do have the hum up full. So we're gonna have some of that nastiness from the hum, but now let's go to the ripple on 10. If 
find some of those artifacts at the end of notes are even more nasty now. So that's it on 10, on zero, still with the hum on 10. Maybe just a little bit of a nastiness. I, I did find that that was one of the parameters that wasn't quite as dramatic, but it, it does have an effect, okay? Let's move on to the bias test. All right, so bias is a whole other thing altogether. Um, Biasing is really, uh, again, I don't want to get too technical about it because I don't really have a full knowledge or understanding of this. I've, I've never had to bias a tube amp myself. It's not really my area of expertise, but it has to do with sort of, from what I understand, and please, anybody can correct me if I'm wrong about this, but it has to do with the... Um, idle current going into the tubes when the, when when it's nothing's being played through at the amount of current going through the tubes and if it's set too high your tube life goes way down they're going to die and I, I even understand if it was ridiculously high it could even you know possibly cause damage right away so um it also affects the tone right you're going to have cold um uh, which would be too low on the bias which would be a cold bias damp or a hot bias damp would be more more current so the Hot biases usually tend to be preferred as far as the sound goes. The cold bias is going to give an probably a little uglier distortion, one with uh, not really the harmonics that that we would want in the distortion. If I, you know, from my experience and my understanding of it. So, again, you know, the, line six has done a brilliant thing that's allowed us to come in and bias the amp in any way we want, right? So maybe we want that that more sterile sound. Um, we can get it. So again, I set up three snapshots. I have uh, bias. So so again, here's bias five, which is the default setting, I believe. Or, or, actually, I think it was 5.5 on the same. Anyways, I, I'm at five here. You'll hear a big thing once I jump right up to the 10 now. Now I'll go to zero. Very different distortion, very edgy, almost uh, abrasive sounding. Not what I would consider a pleasant distortion. If I go back to the bias 10 now, it's not as much distortion even, but it's just a more pleasant musical distortion, I find. Now, if I go in between to five, you can kind of hear the difference. There's a balance of the two. Let me just jump between these again. Bias zero. So this is kind of interesting. You could say, well, wow, so if it's the bias is cold, you almost get that that bitiness, that maybe that um, quality that a lot of people don't like, especially at stage volume. So instead of going in and playing with the mics and the cabs, we could maybe just with a, a little bit of bias control, maybe instead of the default five, we jump up to six and it just takes that edge off the distortion, six and a half, seven, play with that as another parameter that's gonna help us to dial that amp in the way that we want it to sound, maybe a little bit smoother. You know, maybe uh, a little bit, uh, a little bit edgier. However, we want it. So that's what the bias is doing. So now we move on to bias X. And now bi bias X is not a term that I was ever familiar with. I think it's just something Line Six came up with for another parameter. And it, it just seems to have more to do with the voicing of the power tubes. Um, set uh, low, it's going to have a tighter feel, and set high, it's going to be more dynamic, which is kind of similar to the way SAG worked, but I think it's going to just be more of a voicing thing rather than a, a, um, a compression uh, to the sound. So again, if we start off with uh, bias X set at five. Okay, that's the normal amp sound we've had. Now, if I drop that down to zero, 
Compare that to the 10. It's almost a little bit of a warmer sound to bias X10, right? Go back to bias zero. Switch between those, there's zero. Notice the, the pick attack is a little softer, a little bit, uh, a little, just a little bit warmer sound overall to it. Bias 10. So you can see how powerful a control that is as well. My goodness, it's... Uh, so, you know, all we've been doing here is isolating one particular uh, parameter at a time to say, what effect does this have? And I think what we can do now that we have a better understanding of all of those is jump to one here that I put together, which is called parameter test. And I did three examples. Uh, let me see the order that I have these in. So, um, so this snapshot here is just everything at five, kind of like the default setting. Like I said, on this amp, I think the default might've been 5.5, .5, but I don't think that's gonna make a huge difference. So that's the way the amp would just be called up. And what I'm assuming most people would just kind of leave alone. You know, they would dial in their top parameters here and then say, okay, I'm done. Go to their IR or go to their cab and play with the mic and whatever else. Um, but what I did is I set up two other sounds. So I did one that was really to the high end of SAG, higher hum, higher ripple, higher bias, bias X, more of a classic squishy dynamic sound, right? Maybe something you'd hear on some older, older records. And then I did another example, uh, which was everything down low, no hum at all. The, the bias a little bit colder, bias X down to the um, you know less warm sound, not as much sag, more just less dynamic sound. Let me play a little bit switching between these. So here would be the first example where it's set just sort of more at factory default settings. <laughs> now if I jump to the more vintage sound. And if I jump to the other example, the other way. And if I jump to the other way. Very dramatic. I mean, this is very edgy. It's not going to clean up as well if I pick soft. It barely cleans up at all. Whereas this setting. Back to this example that doesn't clean up. You can see how that keeps that edge, right? If I go back to just sort of the stock settings. Kind of in between the two, right? So again, I'll just play a little bit with both. Um, 
So that's without even diving into the other amp parameters, the normal ones, the drive control, the master, and so on and so forth, right? So I could even take something like this more vintage sound and say, okay, I don't really want the master up on 10. I'm going to bring it back to, you know, six and a half. I'm going to bring my normal drive back to maybe seven just to, you know. a whole different tone altogether right it softens it up a bit obviously a little bit less distortion but those parameters are very powerful and it's amazing what we can do uh, when we kind of understand with them when we, what we can do with them when we understand what they do I hope that helped as far as those go I do want to jump over to one more thing here um, I'm gonna go to my dual cabs and just move that to the ribbon mic this cab here and talk a little bit about early reflections that's another question I've had from a lot of folks about do I use early reflections what I find with the early reflections is it's basically a pre-delay setting on the reverb right an early reflection is just going to be the first reverbs arriving back at the microphone after the direct sound hits it right so the bigger the room the longer those reflections are going to take to come back to it so the, the pre-delay on a delay setting kind of does that right it affects how long before we're going to hear the reverb so if i turn the reverb off now um simply because now which uh, setting was i at here okay well, that's probably good enough uh, i'm going to crank these back up to 10 just to okay um actually no let me go to this more even equal snapshot here um okay so we'll go back to the cab here make sure okay so um i'm gonna turn the reverb off because the reverb if we have it on is going to probably not allow us to hear as clearly uh what the early reflections is doing the dis the whole purpose of the early reflections is to give it more of a feel like the cab is in a room right um so on zero <laughs> very dry i don't have any reverb on now again like i was saying before let's just jump this right up to 10 or no, not in this case 10 sorry 100 just to hear what this parameter does <laughs> It, it hollows the sound a bit, but essentially it almost gives almost to the point of a slapback delay, really. Right? Now, obviously, that's way too much. Um, so let's back that off to 50 and see what kind of an effect that has. <laughs> It's not as dramatic, obviously, but maybe if I take that back to zero. Very dry. Back to 50-ish. Now, if I take this to zero, simply put my reverb back on. Look at my reverb settings and go to the pre-delay and say, okay, let's let's do maybe a 50 millisecond pre-delay. So there's 50 milliseconds before the onset of that reverb now. I'll put it down at about 35. If I go back to my cab now and put that 50% or so early reflection on, It's noticeable, but it's it's not dramatic. I find the early reflections control fairly subtle overall, uh, but it is useful. I think uh, a little bit. I don't, you know, obviously at a hundred percent, it was it was pretty 
over the top and I don't think I would use that too often. But when I have used it, I've had it in around 30%, 25, 30, 35, 40, thereabouts. And it, it might just add a little something, but it's, it's a little bit harder to really tell whether it's doing a lot to the sound, you know, so... Anyways, guys, that's turned into another long video. Uh, I just wanted to kind of talk about a uh, few of those features. I hope some of that has helped somebody out there um, uh, to maybe not be afraid of using those parameters and seeing how powerful they can actually be. Maybe it's just one of those things that, that we're missing on a particular patch we're using where if we just tweak up the, the sag by a point or two, it's like, wow, that's it. That's the sound I've wanted. And you've been you know, playing with EQ or compression or microphones and all we had to do is go mess around with the power section a little bit you know um so i i like i always say just go for it try it the worst thing that can happen is that you have to go back and, and go just remember your setting before you know or copy and paste the patch to a new uh, a new uh slot so that you know you, you're not touching the old one if you're happy with the patch then just keep it and play around with it on a copied version of it uh so you get to the point of um being able to uh to maybe tweak that patch a little bit better than you had it before. So, and you can also use snapshots to compare like I was doing. It's a really great, uh, great way to be able to do it. So hope you guys enjoyed and I hope it helped uh, in some way. Um, uh, please leave your comments below. Any questions, suggestions? Uh, I'm happy to always answer and comment and talk about those things. And uh, please subscribe uh, if you haven't already. I'm going to be trying to do uh, a lot more content. I'm even thinking about doing some guitar lesson type things, some of my approaches to lead playing and whatnot. Uh, so let me know if anybody you know is interested in that type of a thing as well. And uh, thanks again so much for your support and your comments. And uh, we'll see you next time.